Welcome to another gathering of the remnant. Come, go with me to the 19th chapter of the gospel according to Matthew. We'll start reading at the 16th verse. Now I'll be reading from the new King James Version. The word. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good things shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, and that is God. But if thou wilt enter into eternal life, keep the commandments. And he said unto him, which? Jesus said, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, Honor your father and your mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man said to Jesus, All these things I have kept from my youth, what lack I yet? Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, agatho, go and sell all that thou hast and give it to the poor. Then thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But when the young man heard that, he went away sorrowful, for he had great wealth. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Assuredly, I say to you that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven and again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, well, then who can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said to them, with men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So ends the reading of God's word, but never the power contained therein. Returning to the 22nd verse, we hear these words. But when the young man heard that, he went away sorrowful, for he had great wealth. On this first Black History Month, Sunday, I wish to offer you a message entitled, But I Don't Want To. But I Don't Want To. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, help us. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. Amen. Uh, today, I realize that some of us have uh, an incredible amount of things to do, so I won't bother you long, but I do have to bother you. God has been bothering me over the last several weeks. And uh, <clears throat> with God and me, our relationship is a constant, ongoing battle. Uh, that I wrestle with him, um, much like Jacob wrestled with God. I understand that. I understand what wrestling with God is because God asks us to do some things that when we look around and we get around certain people and individuals, we realize that what God is asking us, we can't do. I mean, we can't do personally. We, we can't do it ourselves. So what, what has to happen is God wants to put us in a situation that causes us to act in a way that's unlike ourselves and more like him. 
in order to get the job done, you've got to be more like him, not more like you. So this has been a struggle with me and him for the last couple of months. And I'm trying to be more like him. And sometimes I slip up and go back into who I am. (laughs) And uh, it doesn't work out too well. But this particular text that God has been bothering me with is an interesting text because I can't seem to write it down. All my other messages, I'm, I'm able to hand write out and to get it out on paper. And then when I get here, because I am always afraid of going outside and doing something that God didn't tell me to do or say something that God didn't tell me to say. So that, that, that's a, a heavy, real fear for me. So what I write down is what I say because that's what God has given me to say. And that might not be for somebody else. That might, that's just for me. I I know that that's me. That's how God operates with me. I know that there are preachers that can stand before you and just boom and just go. And I have to write it down. Because if I don't write it down, I wind up over in left field and talking about what I feel rather than what God has given me to say. So I'm having trouble once. Uh, in a while, and this particular trouble has come up again. Um, so I, I, I kind of wrote it down, but I, I'm not sure that it's going It's going to go the way <laughs> I think it ought to go because what I have written is not what God is telling me. Now, I've never had, you, you, you've heard pastors, preachers say, well, uh, as soon as I got up there, God changed the, the sermon. It ain't never happened to me. But it's happening now. So I need you to pray with me and pray for me through this message. Amen? I need your help. This message, first of all, is kind of wild because of who's writing it. You see, Matthew was a tax collector. So Matthew understood the economy of what was going on, not only in his life, but within the lives of the people that was living at the time. As a tax collector, he had to go to people's homes, knock on their doors, and say, oh, you got to give it up. Whatever that amount is that they had to give, they had to give to him so he could take it back to the king and take it back to the officials or take it back to the priests. And so Matthew had a real deep understanding of money. He had a real deep understanding of wealth. He had a real deep understanding of how money affects one's life. He understood that because he was a tax collector. So when we read this story in the 19th chapter of Matthew, Matthew is writing, he's written so many other things about Christ, but now this particular writing, it touches him. Because it walks into his world, and it takes his world, and it turns it upside down so that Matthew understands what Jesus is saying. So that Matthew understands why God is calling him. So that Matthew understands that he's got a particular work to do because he works in that environment as it deals with wealth. As it deals with having things that no one else has. Or not too many people have. And another thing about this is the person that Matthew is writing about. I'm not true. I'm not sure if it's true. The writer of the, the many scholars are not sure if this person that he's writing about really existed. Or maybe they think that Matthew is writing about himself. He starts the story off by telling us that Jesus came from uh, Jericho down to Jerusalem. And he goes from Judea in beyond the Jordan to come down with Jesus. Jesus is walking now about and around about. So Jesus and Matthew and the other 12 disciples are walking with Jesus. And Jesus is on his way to do what God has told him to do. So this is not just something that just happened. 
This is a planned thing. And as Matthew is reliving this and he's writing it, he recognizes some things that's in it that turns him around. So he gets here and he says, as they were walking into this town of Jerusalem, a rich young ruler, a young adult with money. Now, what's a young adult with money back in those days? A young adult was considered 13 years of age. That's when they met to a point in which they were legal to do whatever it is that people or adults could do. They were considered adults. They would have a bar mitzvah. The Jewish people would have a bar mitzvah. You had kings that would be 12 and 13 years old. You had a young adult would be somewhere around about 15, 16. But that's long ago. Right now, you got to be what? What is it? 18? 18, 19? What, what's an adult now? 18? But you still got to be 21 to buy beer or cigarettes. You can go to war at 18, but you can't have a drink until you're 21. Sooner or later, some of this will start to make sense. So at the time, as he's walking with Jesus into this town, a rich young ruler, a person of influence, a person of knowledge and wisdom and understanding of what the scriptures are written for and who they're written about. He is a master of Old Testament scripture. You've got to realize that at this time in the text, the Bible was not written. There is no New Testament. It only has the Old Testament. And of the Old Testament that it has, it only has the first five books of the Bible. But he is a master of those five books, this rich young ruler. And he applied these principles that he found in the first five books of the Bible, which brought him wealth. It brought him power. It brought him prestige. It brought him honor. It brought him all the things that make people that looked up to him so that he might look down upon them. The rich young ruler is likely to have known, been known by his religiosity. That's how, how religious he is and how stern he was in what he knew. As a rich young ruler, he was somebody with authority and, and, and influence. He was also proud and tried to keep all of the 365 commandments that was written as after the first 10 commandments was written in the Old Testament. At the time of our text, many rich, influential people were drawn to Jesus, and many were not. Most people during this time were not drawn to Jesus. We're drawn to Jesus because we know the end of the story. At this time, people did not understand who Jesus was. And the people that were in authority, such as the Jewish priests and the high priests and the Sadducees and the Pharisees, they were the ones in charge. They had authority. So if you had an issue or a problem, you either had to go to the Roman government or you had to go to a chief priest. And Jesus walks in, and he goes, wait a minute, you don't have to do that. It's oh, yes, we do. How, why do we have to do that? Because it's written in the law. It's written in the first five books of the Old Testament. It's Moses' law that we must follow. And if we don't follow Moses' law, we don't get anywhere. You see, I followed Moses' law, and now I'm a wealthy, influential person. Wealthy individual persons went to school. 95% of the other people in the world were not educated from an educational standpoint. It was the things that they learned in life, the natural things of life. They understood that the sun rose in the east and set in the west. They understood that. They understood mathematics because they had to build buildings. But these people didn't go to school for that. They learned that they were craftsmen. And they learned from their craft and through their craft. So 
Matthew learned to be a tax collector and he re realized the value of a dollar. So, he walks up to Jesus as Jesus and the disciples are coming into town. And he sees Jesus. And here's one of the things that's weird about the text. If you don't know it, it doesn't, you know, you just read right through it. But this, this rich young ruler runs after Jesus and goes, Rabbi, Rabbi. This is weird because Jewish men in this time did not run. They didn't run because they thought that was uh, beneath them. They wouldn't run up to another man because they thought this was something that was unlikely. It's not something that you would do. Jewish men did not run. They would walk up to you, but here, this rich young ruler don't care nothing about that at this point. He's trying to get to Jesus so he can get his point across. So he runs up to Jesus and he says, Rabbi, Rabbi, we know that you are good. Now, here's the thing. Just think about how this plays out. Jesus, he runs up to Jesus. Now, one, I think, first of all, Jesus is going, hmm, this is odd. Because we don't run. So this is up to me in my mind's eye. This is going, hmm, interesting. So as the rich young ruler gets there, he bows down at Jesus' feet and says, Rabbi, Rabbi, what must I do to be saved? Which tells me that he already understood some of the things that Jesus was telling the people in the first place. This is contradicting of what he already thought. So he goes to Jesus and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He says, whoa, 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 okay, hold up. So Jesus checks him, hold up for a second here, right? No one's good except for my Father in heaven. He didn't point to himself. He pointed to his Father in heaven. So now, he stands to his feet and he goes, hmm. This is how this is playing out. This is real life stuff that Matthew is writing down. Why? Because he was there. Why did he write it? Because it's important. Why is it important? Because it has to do with your eternal life. So, Jesus replies, there is no one good, namely, other than God the Father. Perhaps Jesus was waiting for a response from the rich young ruler to affirm that he understood who he was. But the rich young ruler didn't. He didn't really realize who Jesus was. This is the 19th chapter now. So it's been a time that Matthew has been walking with Jesus and Jesus has been walking with the other 11 disciples. Even Judas is in the bunch. So he's walking with them and he gets there and now Jesus got a little notoriety because he's already healed the blind. He's already healed the sick. He's already raised the dead. So he's got a little bit of, of, of notoriety. So the guy runs up to him and says, hey, I know that you're good. I know that you're sent from God. And I know that you know this. What do I need to do to inherit eternal life? So Jesus plays him for a second. And he says, well, I tell you what. Obey the commandments. Now you got to realize, this is all they had. They didn't have a New Testament. All they had was the Old Testament. The Old Testament had ten commandments. But at the time that this is being written, they switched the ten to over 365 commandments. So the man sat back and goes, well, what commandments? So Jesus, in his knowledge of the written word of God and also the word of God, reaches back and takes the bottom five through nine, which deals with the relationship between me and you, the human relationship, the, the horizontal relationship. He's not the, 
the, the, the rich young ruler is talking about the relationship between him and God, which is vertical. But Jesus comes to him and says to him, the relationship I'm talking about is horizontal between you and you, between us as a people, between mother and father, between sister and brother, between family and friend. That relationship. Now, if you want to talk about that relationship, then here you go. This is what you want, this is what you want to do. Okay? Obey the commandments. He says, which ones? He says, well, five through nine. Thou shalt not murder. That's a relationship between you and family. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. And honor your mother and father. And thou and do not bear false witness. And, and, and here it is. Here it is. Love thy neighbor as you do thyself. Five of the top ten. But what the rich young you ruler was dealing with is the 365 that they made up. Jesus is telling him that if he could just keep those horizontal commandments that deal with the relationship between us as a people, you might have a chance to inherit eternal life. Jesus knows the challenges in us. He realizes that our relationships down here don't work very well. We keep taking people and throwing them to the side. We keep taking people, and if they do something to us, rather than forgiving them, we get rid of them. Oh, somebody just heard that. Sometimes the things that we do down here do not work up there. But we keep thinking that because we're living down here, we have to play by the rules that's down here. And Jesus is trying to get us to understand that no, there is a better way. So he says to the rich young youth, just obey those. And he goes, well, the rich young youth says, hey, you know what? I've done all those. What's next? I ain't murdered nobody. Check the box. I haven't had adultery. Check the box. I haven't killed anyone. Check the box. I don't lie. Check the box. I got all that, Jesus. What are you saying now? So now Jesus, I think, if we, if we think about this, this, these are human connections. These are just not words printed on a page. We got to get behind the text to find out what's really happening in this situation. Not just read the text and say, oh, yeah, this is a story. No, get behind the text. Do a little bit more. When we talk about studying the word of God, we're talking about getting behind the text and understanding these are real people in real situations in real life. And what they're doing is they're writing down their experience that happened. What must I do to obtain eternal life? Well, one of the things that we got to understand is what does the rich young ruler mean by eternal life? What do you mean when you say eternal life? Is eternal life in heaven the same? Is living with Jesus eternal life? Do you have to be dead to have eternal life? Well, we know this, you are not going to get out of this life alive. Hey, listen, there are hundreds and thousands of people who want to go to heaven but don't want to die. You can't get there any other way. The amount of sadness that we have and that we feel as it relates to death is the very release that we're asking for, for eternal life. You have to let go of one in order to obtain the other. So why is it such a big deal? Then why do we hold so tight and we squeeze every moment out of every minute of every day for our lives? We go through all the things that we go through. And the Bible tells us that our lives is but a flicker, like a flicker of light on a candle. 
as it relates to eternity. So who, what, what, what is this kid talking about? Is he talking about living forever? Is he talking about living forever with Jesus? Or is he talking about just living forever? So we got to figure this out. And Jesus is figuring this out because that's what Jesus is doing. And this is what I love about Jesus. <laughs> he always takes us from where we are to where we need to be. In other words, the Bible is written in this way. I heard the old wise preachers once say that the Old Testament is Christ concealed. In the writings, it's talking about Jesus. All the stuff that they're talking about in the Old Testament is really about Christ, and it's concealed in the words. So if you're not able to deconstruct the words and understand the stories, then we miss actually who Jesus is. And this was the problem with the rich young ruler. He hadn't deconstructed the Old Testament to see Jesus in it. However, the New Testament is Jesus revealed. That means that's all it's about. And here's the weird thing about it. I shouldn't say weird. That's not a good word. I take that back. Here's an important thing about the word. Because in the word of the New Testament, it points to who Jesus is, but Jesus does not point to himself. In the New Testament, the people have to know who Jesus is. And if they say they read it and they understand who he is based upon the Old Testament, then they understand. But if they can't understand who Jesus is by reading the Old Testament, then they really don't understand who Jesus is. Because the Old Testament is Jesus concealed, but the New Testament is Jesus revealed. So the ideal here now, Jesus recognizes that the young man, the rich young ruler, he's got his A's and B's, he's got his T's crossed and his I's dotted, but he don't understand who he is because he's asking him about eternal life. What can he do? In the long run, this is what Jesus has been telling the people all along, what to do. So Jesus says to him, Get this now. As they're talking, the rich young miller said, I've done all those things. And Jesus says to him, well, if you want to be perfect, go sell all that you have. This is Matthew. This is in Matthew's mind, not yours. Matthew understands the power of wealth. So when Matthew heard this, I think Matthew went, hmm? People today are working for the bag. A lot of what they're doing is about the bag. And so when they get the bag, they feel as if though they've got the power because money and power is excessive. Great wealth is comes great power. But we forget that the Bible tells us with great power comes great responsibility. But the rich young ruler doesn't recognize who Jesus is. So he says to him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Do I need to pay for it? How much it costs? I got it. What? what you, I, I need to know the rules? I got the rules. Tell me. I know all Ten Commandments. Tell me. I know all the commandments. I know when I'm supposed to come up. I know when I'm supposed to sit down. I know when I'm supposed to talk. When I'm not supposed to talk. I know we don't do nothing on Sunday. I got the rules. Now, what else do I need? See, Jesus has been telling them something else. And now he's going to check Jesus. So Jesus says to him, I'll tell you what then. Go sell all that you've got. And not just sell it, but whatever you get in proceeds, 
give it to the poor. Imagine that scene in your mind. Here's a man dripping in fine linen with gold shackles on his arms and legs and feet, hair quaffed to the perfect letter, beard shapen. Everything about him speaks of money and power. And Jesus tells him, go sell everything you got and give it to the people that have nothing. You want to make heaven? Do that. I think Jesus steps back and just looks at him like, what you going to do now? See, it's like, it's like checkmate. It's like check. Jesus moves, makes the move, says it to him, and steps back and waits for his reply. And this is what happens to us. We ask Jesus and we pray to Jesus about a lot of things, and then Jesus gives us the reply, and then we sit there and go, uh, but I don't want to do that. I don't want to. Jesus said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You got all these other things. You want to know what it takes to inherit eternal life. Go do this. But I don't want to. See, this is the thing that happens with us. When we don't want to do a thing because we have this power to say no to Jesus, we go, I, I don't want to do it. But just like Mama Carol said, there's a consequence. You're going to have to pay for it down the line. There's consequences and repercussions that happens. You don't want to do it? Jesus says, okay, I'm good with that. But you now, don't come to me asking me what must you do. I'm telling you what you must do. Your heart must be in a place where people understand who you are and that you are a good person. Not trying to be a good person, but that you are a good person. That you're willing to help the poor. That you're willing to help those that have less. You have to help those that are marginalized. You have to help those that are disenfranchised. That you have to help people other than yourself. Because God's got you. You don't have to work and worry about yourself. You need to worry about others. Because the major rule that Jesus repeats to the man is says, Love thy neighbor as you do thyself. When you can get to that point, when you can stop worrying about yourself, I found the Lord. We, 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 we give worship. I found the Lord. He's heard my cry. The Lord is with me. Well, if that's the case, go do what he told you to do. But I don't want to. Because I think this is the way it should be. Because this is what was written. This is how it's said. This is how I learned it. This is what it's about. And Jesus is saying to him, all that is written points to me. So I'm telling you, this is what you can do this. And you can have eternal life. <laughs> but I don't want to. Nah, nah. So this, this, this part of the sermon is always preached because now you're talking about wealth and, you know, Jesus don't want us to be poor, but we read poor in spirit, humble, meek, and mild. But I don't want to. I want to rip their face off and let them know who I am because I'm him. I'm that guy. So this ideal that Jesus is presenting to this rich young ruler is the ideal that you have to be like me. You have to be like Jesus. That's what makes you a Christian. If you are not like Jesus... 
you're the opposite of what Jesus is, then how do you want to live with him for eternity? That's what you live with. You live with him for eternity. So here's the thing. And this is what really caught me on this whole text. As I started to read it, this is what got me. I'm going to say this and then I'm going to leave you alone. I I ain't going to bother you no more. Do you think the rich young ruler walked away because Jesus told him to give away his wealth? You think that's what it was? This is what I think it was. Because at the end of that statement, when Jesus tells him to give all away, give all his wealth away, and then give it to the poor, he said, then, then, come follow me. It's not just giving your wealth away, showing that you really care about other people, but come, follow me. And this following is not a walking behind. It's a becoming like. That's what follow me means, that you are becoming more and more like Jesus. But it's very difficult for us to do that. It's very difficult for some of us to do that because we don't want to really follow Jesus and do what Jesus did because in our minds we still don't understand that Jesus is our only salvation. We think that we're going to make it in because we're good readers of the word that we're good quoters of the words, that we're good performers of the word, that we can do what we know that's in the book. We listen very well or that we go out and we do what we think needs to be done very well. But there are times when God will ask you to do something that you cannot do without him. So you have to walk with him. You have to talk with him. You have to be with him. You have to understand him. You have to be his child. Then he'll give you something that you will always have. And it will never be taken away from you. And that's the Holy Spirit. And it will reside with you. It will walk with you. It will talk with you. It will give you the answers to your life's most promising or puzzling problems. That's when Jesus died on that cross. His spirit was released to all men, women, boys, and girls all around the world. And taking that spirit of Christ makes you like Christ. He says, out of all that you do, because even if you sell all that you have, that's not the deal. That's just showing that you're willing. But if you follow me, then you get eternal life. So please, stop with the I don't want to. Because God won't never lead you to something that he won't lead you through something. No matter what you give, you can't beat God giving. When you do for others, God provides for you to do more. This this is what it's about. And after a while, you'll notice that you you ain't got to change nothing in your life. There's only one thing that you got to change. 
And that's to stop telling God what you're not going to do. If he tells you, do it. This has been a word of God for the people of God, for the edification of God's kingdom.